Hey there, and welcome back to another My Hero Academia video. And today, we're going to be talking about the latest episode to drop, episode 18, Izuku Midoriya and Tomura Shigaraki, which picks up from where the previous episode left off, with Deku in his vestige coma, and about to have a talk with the previous users of One For All about what's been going on, and where they go from here. And before we go any further, I would like to say that I have read the manga and I'm aware of any relevant future plot points and details, but for the purpose of these reviews, I really prefer to look at things from an anime-only perspective so that anime-only fans can watch along and join in too. On top of that, it's probably been a while since I read the manga, and I'm not exactly 100% on all the details anymore, so, you know, be warned. And so, with all that being said, guess there's nothing else for it but to dive into the episode. So yeah, we start off with a recap of Deku in the Vestige Realm before we hit the intro theme, which, you know, I've really come around to this theme. I'm loving it. It's classic. But anyway, moving on from that, we return to the Vestige Realm and we get to take a look at the majority of the previous users, even though two of the users are just lingering in the background facing a wall saying nothing. The first user talks about how previously the Vestiges couldn't really communicate with one another, or even with Deku, but recently the power has started to grow and grow which in turn allowed the Vestiges to start to communicate with one another. And that now that All For Ones tried to steal the power, that further barrier between the Vestiges and between Deku has been broken down, and so now they can communicate with him at will as well. Anyway, Deku's able to speak a little bit, despite his mouth being covered up with some... smoke sort of stuff, which prompts the fourth user to speak to him, telling him that it was a surprise when Deku manifested his quirk out of nowhere, before he uses his quirk to start a game of cat and mouse with the fifth user, dodging all his Black Whip attacks while continuing to speak to Deku. Honestly, this was unexpectedly funny. I really do enjoy jokes like this. And so the fourth user suddenly rocketed into the position of being my favourite vestige spirit. I really love the serious characters that suddenly do something really funny. Anyway, the fourth user reveals that he died of old age, and that they'd learned this from All Might's vestige spirit. And they learned this when All Might was doing the research into the past uses of One For All, which in turn suggests that these vestiges they're not just lingering pieces of the past, or the quirk factor. They are the actual consciousness of these people. After all, All Might doesn't have the quirk anymore. He's passed it on and the embers are gone. But he's still connected to it. And thus, his vestige can connect to his mind to get the info that All Might has discovered even after he's passed on the quirk. So, must be some sort of mystical component to it. But yeah, fourth user died of old age, which made them realize that only a quirkless person can use this quirk properly. As since they have no quirk, one for all becomes their quirk. They become the perfect vessel. They can hold it. Whereas if you had a quirk already, one for all chips away at you, as your vessel was already full at that time. And this is what happened to the fourth user, who held the quirk for the longest time next to All Might, inheriting it and holding it for 18 years before passing it on and dying. The first user then makes it clear to Deku that the quirk can't be passed on to anybody except for a quirkless person. And since they're becoming rarer and rarer with each generation, even if Deku does manage to find somebody, eventually it will run out and the quirk won't be passed on. And so in all honesty, it's pretty clear to me now that the idea here is that he will be the last user. Whilst he could potentially pass it on, I think narratively, he just won't. I mean honestly, otherwise this thing would get too strong anyway. They then move on from this topic when Shimura speaks up, asking Deku whether he'll be able to kill Shigaraki in the end. Not as a personal request, but more of a question of resolve. Would he actually be able to go through with taking a life if he needed to? Because ultimately, they saw what he saw. Shigaraki was in pain. But instead of thinking that he looked like he wanted to be saved like Deku thought, the other vestiges simply saw his hatred. And they disagree with Deku completely, suggesting that he might be beyond redemption. We also learned from them that All For One's using Shigaraki's hatred as a tool to finally get his hands on One For All, as it can't be stolen unless it can be overpowered, which just isn't possible for one person alone. But now that he's merged with Shigaraki and melded their power together, it's a much more realistic possibility that he'll be able to do it. And thus, Deku's in a lot more danger than he was before. The first wielder then tells Deku that One For All supposedly meant to destroy All For One. That is its primary purpose. And that originally they had thought that All Might had managed to accomplish this. But since All For One's so determined, he managed to continue surviving on and return to power. Shimura then speaks up and apologizes to Deku for putting him in this position to have to correct her mistakes and to have to stop her grandson when she feels like it's her fault that he turned out this way anyway. But that regardless, he needs to be taken down before he can finish his transformation, because after that, nobody, not even Deku, is going to be able to stop him. She goes on to tell Deku that some people are just irredeemable, and asks once again, does he have the resolve to kill Shigaraki if it comes down to it? Could he do it? And he says, yeah, he could, but he doesn't want to. That he thinks one for all is a power that's not meant for killing people, but instead for saving people just like what All Might taught him. 
and that ultimately that is what he's going to aim to do. Because inside he can see that Shigaraki's still a scared little boy crying out to be saved by a hero. And this in turn of course makes Shimura cry because, you know, why wouldn't it make you cry? And she reveals that this was all a test to see what Deku was going to say, and that the vestiges don't actually want him to kill Shigaraki if he doesn't have to. Shimura cries and realises that perhaps she'd made the wrong decision after all giving up her son, and thus she blames herself for what happened to her grandson. But regardless, she's thankful for All Might and the values that he instilled in Deku. And honestly, true, right? I know All Might gets a little bit of flack because, honestly, he was a bit of a poor teacher at first. But he's just such an inspirational Chad. Think of all the characters that he's inspired in their backstories. You watch their backstory and All Might's on the TV. He's such a wholesome and good person. Ah, I love All Might. But anyway, back to Shimura. Her story has got to be the saddest in the show, right? Imagine leaving behind your son to protect him from getting murdered by a crazy supervillain just like his father was, only to be revived as a spirit inside one of your successors and discover that not only did your son turn into an abusive piece of shit that beat your grandson, but that he successfully drove him to insanity and caused him to murder his whole family and get adopted by the very dude that killed your husband and you and crippled your apprentice and is now out to destroy the world. That would feel pretty shit. I mean, it's not her fault at all in my eyes, but yeah, kind of sucks. And then we move on from that part of the episode and return to the hospital, where Hawks and Best Genius ask to speak to All Might in order to puzzle out the mystery behind One For All and what Shigaraki was talking about during the battle. And of course, all the while, All Might can sort of feel what's going on in the Vested Realm, so I guess when he dies, he actually is going to go into that Vested Realm inside of Deku, I suppose? Almost like a Horcrux from Harry Potter, is that what's going to go on here? Uh, I guess it's less bad than that, but still, I kind of want to know the details here. Back on topic though, Hawks and Best Genus come into the room and ask All Might what's going on, and since they mention the name of the quirk, he really does have no choice but to fill them in on everything. The age of one for all being a mystery is just about over with, and so he ends up telling them all about it off screen. And good, that would have been a very long scene that doesn't really add anything to the story. What we get instead is a press conference with Endeavor, Best Genius and Hawks, where they talk about what's happened, they offer their apologies, and they state their determination to fix things, which obviously, coming from Hawks and Endeavor, is not exactly a calming sentiment. As Hawks is now the known son of a criminal and was proven to have killed a villain trying to run away, and Endeavor's son is a terrorist who ruined Endeavor's reputation completely by exposing his misdeeds. And so they get lambasted and yelled at and blamed. And you know what? Fair enough. I understand why everyone's angry, especially at Endeavor. I mean, it's not really their fault, but I get why people are mad. They go on to say that they'll try to protect everybody, but that with fewer heroes after all the deaths and resignations, they're going to need to turn hero schools that have adequate security into makeshift shelters to protect people en masse, instead of being forced to patrol everywhere all at once with overstretched resources. So, looks like Japan's about to get trashed, but on the bright side, in the aftermath there's going to be lots of jobs for construction workers. Cementos, this is your time mate. So I guess that's something. And then we finish off the episode with Deku having written personalised letters for each of his classmates, explaining that he inherited his quirk from All Might and that All For One's going to be hunting him down, so it's no longer going to be safe for his classmates for him to be around them. And thus he's quit UA and he's become a vigilante, which, yeah, it's a pretty extreme move, but it's one that was probably necessary from his point of view. After all, society needs time to recover and come together, and he wants to keep his friends safe. And so now that the cat's well and truly out of the bag, I'm curious to see where all this goes, and I'm pretty hyped to see him fight muscular next week, as we see in the preview. Their first fight, it was pretty awesome in the training camp, so I'm really excited to see where they go from here. And I'm also hyped to see him wearing his hood for once. Makes him look really ominous and threatening, which, you know, it's ironic since it's meant to mimic All Might's smile, which is there to reassure people. This, this has the opposite effect, completely and utterly. It's more frightening than anything else. And so yeah... Nothing really else to say about the episode. That's the end of the review. And I would like to remind you, these are just my opinions, and now I'd like to hear yours. What did you think of the episode? Do you like it? Hate it? I'm curious for your thoughts, so make sure to like, comment, subscribe, and let me know.